Hello, good evening, and welcome to Practical Christianity Bible Study. My name is Tunde Disu. Thank you for taking the time to be part of tonight's program. I can confidently say this is the final episode on the series that we've been doing since January, I think, how we've been looking at healing is your birthright. Healing is your birthright. And I think this is pro episode number 11 or 12 on the series. So it's been a long journey, but I'll, I mentioned at the beginning that irrespective of how long it takes until I feel a release in my spirit that we've covered enough grounds to give you understanding, to help you recognize who you are and what you have as an inheritance in God, especially where healing is concerned, then I'm going to continue doing it. Uh, when we started, I, nobody knew anything about, well, there was some talks about coronavirus, but that wasn't why we started. But look how God has worked this thing out. We have spent the better part of two months talking about divine healing and that healing is available to you, it's accessible to you, it is yours by right. And then this pandemic hits the world. Um, it, so I believe God prepared us with this uh, series for us to be in a place of knowing, for us to be in a place of understanding so that we can know how to respond and how to manage ourselves, how to to hold ourselves and not let our hearts be troubled because of, of the news and the effects and all that is going on around us. So again, this is the final episode or the final uh, program on the series that we started in January titled Healing is Your Birthright. Healing is your birthright. But tonight, we're going to conclude what we were talking about last week, how to keep your healing. Now you've been healed. Now you've been delivered. Now you've been set free. Now God has touched you and you are healed in your soul, in your mind, in your body. But then what happens? What then do you have to do to maintain what you have received? to safeguard what God has done for you, to prevent your life falling back into that same place of sickness, of disease, of pain, of discomfort. What can you do? What can I do? What can we do collectively to preserve, to maintain, to sustain, to uphold the, 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 the inheritance that God gave us? Because like I said in one of our, well, several of, our, of this series, I've said it again and again and again. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, when Jesus shed his blood, when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't just talking about the salvation of your soul. He was not just referring to you getting a one-way ticket to go to heaven. Included in that same passage, and in that same package, at that same time, on that same cross, by the same blood that was shed for you and I, included in the salvation package, was your healing and my healing. And unfortunately, religion has done uh, many of us a disservice of thinking. Healing is just a tag along where our salvation is concerned. Healing is just something, it's an additional like you are buying a car insurance and then you say, okay, okay, uh, I think I will have roadside assistance added to that. Uh, I think I'll have uh, legal cover added to that. No, healing is part and parcel of the comprehensive insurance that Jesus gave us when he died on the cross, when he was buried, and when he rose from the dead. So your healing is as as guarantee, it's as finished and as confirmed as your salvation is. So healing is your birthright. Healing is my birthright. 
healing is our inheritance. It is part and parcel of what we have received as children of God. Healing is your birthright. So keep it. Don't lose it. Healing is your birthright. So keep it. Don't lose it. Because over the past few weeks, we have established that it is God's will for you and I to be healed. He said, above all things, above everything else, above anything and everything, there is something I want for you. There is a plan and a purpose I have for you. There is a, a desire in my heart, and that desire is that you be in health. And you prosper, even as your soul is prospering. So we have established that it is God's will for us to be healed. We've also established the fact that you are already healed. You are not going to be healed. You are not going to be made whole. You are not going to be delivered. You have already been healed. And I think as Christians, we struggle to, to get this concept into our, into our heads and into our mind, into our hearts, the fact that you are not going to be healed, the fact that you are not going to be delivered, the, the truth is you are already healed. He said, by his stripes, you were, past tense, you were healed. So God has completed your healing and my healing when Jesus said it is finished. We also establish that God has no sickness to give to anybody. So all these teachings and all this doctrine about, oh, this is your cross to bear. This is God trying to teach you so that you can learn patience, so that you can learn obedience. So that you can... No, God does not use sickness and disease, pain and discomfort to teach his children. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the work of the, of the Word of God. Sickness and disease are from the devil. And the devil does not work for God. For God. He is self-employed. We also establish that Jesus gave you and I the power and the authority that God gave to him. He gave that same power and authority to you and I not just so that we can be healed, but through us, we too can see others healed. He said, in my name, you will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. That is the power. That is the authority that was given to you and I by Jesus Christ. Because there is that power. There is power in his name. There is power in his blood. There is power in the word of God, especially concerning your healing and my healing. So we've established all of this in the past few weeks. But the question that we've been trying to answer since last week is, if all of this has been done and completed as you are saying to me, how come some, how, why then? How, what do you, how do you explain the fact that some people get healed and somewhere down the line, the sickness comes back? Like Jesus' disciples said to him, when he healed a man who was, who was born blind, I mean born lame, deaf, dumb and everything, and Jesus healed that man, and his disciples came to him and said, Master, who sinned that this man was born this way? Is it his parents or is it the man himself? And Jesus says, neither. He said, neither. Not the man, not his parents. He saw that the goodness of God, the power of God, the glory of God may be manifested through him as a vessel. So some people were healed. Or somewhere along the line, the sickness comes back. Why is it that people that have that have been supernaturally and divinely healed, why do they have the symptoms coming back on them again? Why do they fall into this illness all over again? And so last week we started looking at different reasons why this is so. 
But one thing I want you to know is that the integrity of God, which is perhaps one of his, if it not the greatest of his attributes, his integrity is intact. His words are his will. His will are his plans. His plans are his purpose. And he said, I know the plans that I have for you. To do you good, not of evil. To give you an expected end. So God watches over his word to ensure that once they come out of his mouth, once they are released from his spirit, they are settled, they are confirmed. And that is why God does, God does not speak carelessly like we do. God does not just speak loosely like we do. Do you know why? Because he knows very well. He has the full understanding that whatever comes out of his mouth is established. Matthew 8, 17 tells us that he might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself, took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He himself, who? Jesus Christ himself. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send a prophet, not an apostle, an evangelist, a teacher. or, or, or No, he himself. He took, took it upon himself. No wonder John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who took away the, the, the sins of the world. And you know sickness is a precursor. It's a, it's a symptom. In some cases of sin. In the same sacrifice that you were born again, it's in the same sacrifice that your healing was established. Because First Peter chapter 2, verse 24 tells us who his own self, just to clarify, to take away any form of ambiguity or, 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 or doubt. No. Who his own self bear, bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. You can see the two brought together in one place, the righteousness of God that was exchanged for our sins and the healing of God that was exchanged for our sicknesses. So last week we looked at why do people, after being healed, how come the sickness comes out? How come they seem to lose their healing? So we talked about the fact that the number one reason is because they lack understanding. They lack understanding. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, in all of your getting, get understanding. As you are getting your healing, make sure you get it with understanding. As you are getting your, your salvation, get it with understanding. As you are getting anything and everything in life, get understanding. Do you know why? Because the enemy can only steal from you what you don't understand. But you see, for years, as Christians, we have, we have, we have misunderstood that concept. We have substituted our understanding with knowledge. Oh yes, I know that scripture. Oh yes, I know by his stripes I'm healed. Oh yes, I know he himself took my sickness upon him. We thought by knowing we understood. No. Knowledge, there is data. When you gather data, it becomes an information. When you, when you manipulate the information, it gives you knowledge. But that alone is not enough. That knowledge now has to be understood. Many of us learned quadratic equation in secondary school. But all we had was head knowledge. That is why many people, in fact, the whole educational system is set up in such a way that you, they give you knowledge, no understanding. That is why as soon as you write your exam on that particular subject, you don't remember anything because they just give you enough knowledge to pass the exam. But for those that will understand why X2 plus Y2 will become Z3 or whatever it is, when they encounter any difficulty, when they encounter any, any, any calculation in life, they know how to apply it. 
Because they have understanding. So the number one reason people lose their healing or get back into, heal, into sickness and disease when they have already been healed before is because they lack the understanding of how the healing came about. They lack the understanding of the fact that they were healed. They've been healed. They are never supposed to be sick again. And so they entertain other things that will make the sickness come back. Yet last week we also said another reason why people get sick after being healed is because they don't have, they don't realize that healing is theirs by right. It is their it belongs to them as a child of God. So they go beggarly. They go groveling. They go cap in hand for healing. And the enemy seizes upon that ignorance and hold them down and oppress them some more and rob them of their healing some more, of their sound mind a little bit. Thirdly, we said, the reason a lot of people, after being healed, they, they tend to fall back into the sickness is because of what they are hearing. The Bible said, faith comes by hearing. And that is if you are hearing the word of God. But you and I know, we're all hearing a lot of things. Even in churches. Just because you go to church does not mean you are hearing the word that will build faith in you. If you go to a church, for instance, where the pastor teaches that this sickness is God's way of, of, of pruning you and making you better, then why would you want to get healed? Because you want God to use you. You want to become a vessel of honor in his hand. So you would allow the sickness to prune you a little bit more. When you go to a church, when the pastor teaches that, forget about all this healing story. Healing passed away with the early apostles. So when sickness and disease lands on you, guess what? You're thinking, well, this is my cross to bear. Since healing has passed away with the early apostles, what are you hearing? Because fear entertained is faith contaminated. When you hear bad things, it will form bad fruit out of you. A good man, out of the goodness of his heart, will bring forth good fruit. Same will do for a bad one. So those were the three we looked at last week. So this week we're going to look at maybe two or three more, time permitting. The next reason why people seem unable to keep their healing is the fact that their faith is not sustained. Their faith, it, it, well, let me break it down this way. The book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 said, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just will live by his own faith. What do I mean? Maybe you go, you are in a church, or you are attending a crusade, or an open-air program, or whatever, Just or you are watching a TV, and, and anything could happen. And because of the corporate faith that permeates and, and just deluge that atmosphere, things are happening. People are being healed, delivered, made whole, and all of that. And so, if you are in that environment, if you are in that atmosphere where corporate faith is, is laden and, and, and it's, it's making, it's giving life to things, you could be healed. In fact, you will be healed. However, because people don't see. One of the worst things that's happened to us as Christians is church. I'm sorry to say that. I'm a pastor. And I can tell you this. Because we have been trained. We have been, been educated. We have been groomed 
to say you are only healed. You only know that you've been healed, for instance, if the pastor calls you out or calls your name or mention your specific illness and say, oh, there's somebody here. You have you have pain on your right shoulder and now God is healing you. That is when you know you've been healed. Well, imagine we have a, a congregation, even of 200 people. The pastor will spend the whole night without preaching, just calling each person's illness. Secondly, you must understand that whatever the pastor is calling, it's not because he wants to call that, it's as the Spirit leads, if he's led by the Spirit of God. So a lot of people go into this type of atmosphere and they're waiting for the pastor to call them out, to point in that direction, to wave his hand at them, to mention the type of he of illness that they have. And if he doesn't do that, even if Jesus himself sat on their shoulders, they will still not receive because the man of God didn't call their sickness. But in an environment, in an atmosphere laden with the presence of God like that, Healings and miracles, signs and wonders are happening. So many people are healed that way, but because they have not acknowledged, they, 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 they fail to realize that they've been healed, they still carry on as if they, they're not. But that's not really the issue. The challenge is, even sometimes, the Spirit of God just wants to perform wonders, just run around the whole place and heal everybody and deliver and set free. But they don't know. And so, you go home, even though you've been healed, and you're still complaining. This arthritis is going to kill you. This, your back is just getting worse. This, your heart is failing to be. This headache is just going to split your head in half. Because you, 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 number one, you fail to recognize that you've been healed. Number two, even though you were healed by the corporate atmosphere, the corporate faith, the move of God in that gathering, when you get home, you need your own faith to sustain it, to uphold it, to keep it in place. But if you, if you have not recognized and agreed that you've been healed, you can't summon your faith to, to, to sustain it. You remember the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 9. There was Peter preaching. Paul, or, or one of them, Paul preaching. And the Bible said, there was a man in that place who was listening. And it got to a point that Peter, I mean Paul rather, felt in his spirit that this man has faith to be healed. That man has faith to be, and was healed in that instance. But you see, even though that man was healed in that instance, if that man goes home and does not have the faith, because it is Peter. Why did I keep calling him Peter? It, it was Paul. It was Paul that saw that this man has the faith to be healed. If that man then, after leaving that gathering, he goes home and does not sustain that healing with his own faith. Paul's faith is not going to follow him around the house. It's not going to go with him to work. It's not going to go with him to anywhere he's going. It is his own faith now that should sustain him. But if he doesn't have that faith, guess what? The preacher... Or the evangelist might have, might be manifesting a dynamic, power part faith. But you don't live in his house, even if you live in his house. Remember what Habakkuk said, The just shall, shall live, shall be made whole, shall exist and sustain himself by his own faith. Unless your faith is able to sustain you and uphold you and protect what you have received, 
Enjoy your white love. Because sometimes the anointing on the minister or the preacher or the evangelist will do wonders. Remember in Luke chapter 6 verse 19, when Jesus was preaching, he said, And the whole multitude, they sought to touch him. For there went out of him virtue and healed them all. All of them were healed. Even the one with a splinter under his nail was healed. The one with cancer ready to die was healed. All of them were healed. Why? Because healing virtue was going out of Jesus. Was just pouring out. But after that, when Jesus has gone to his own abode and you have gone back to your farm, to your fishing, to your market, to your business, to your house. You need your own faith. If you don't have your faith to sustain you, to uphold you, to protect that which you have received, you are at the mercy of the enemy. Because when you are back at home, when you feel that ouch, when you feel that pain again, when that your heart skip a little bit, when suddenly you have to move your head to see properly again, when all of a sudden you feel a, a, a dryness in your throat, are you going to say, oh, they say coronavirus is in town? Or are you going to say, it could be anywhere, no, but not in my house? What do you mean not in your house? Yeah, because the word of God tells me that no plague shall come near my dwelling. Ah, now, now you know. It's not just a head knowledge. It's an understanding that is coming from the inside of you. So when the devil come knocking, knock, 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 you're going to send faith to go and open the door. And the devil say, oh, it's faith. And he will, he will run. Satan, the enemy can only steal from you what you don't understand. Oh, Father, help me. Uh, where am I? You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it tells us, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is a faithful that promised. Let us hold fast without wavering. Let us, what you have received, hold on to it. Don't let the illness or the symptom or the feeling or the report or the comment shake your faith. You may have been healed through corporate faith. You may, by, may have been healed through the special administration or, or special dispensation of an anointing on a, on a vessel of God. But at the end of the day, it is what you do with your faith that will sustain your healing. Next reason why people tend to not protect and preserve their healing is that their faith is not based on the word of God. Their faith, or what they call faith, is not based on the word of God. And with all due respect, this is one area where a lot of pastors and bishops and geos and reverend and apostles and whatever their type need to be mindful that they don't continue to point the church of Jesus Christ to uh, to 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 make the church, the members of their church, look up to them rather than looking up to God. Unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. Now, God anointed vessels. It was Jesus himself, after he ascended, that he left gifts for some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the edification and the equipping of the church. And I respect, I honor 
the vessels of God in those offices. But ultimately, none of you died for anybody. Ultimately, none of you, none of your blood is enough to cleanse you yourself of your, of your sins, not to talk of the congregation. Stop making yourself look bigger than God himself. Because when you do that over time, people start looking up to you rather than looking up to God. And their faith, the just will live by their faith. Their faith is attached to you as a person, not to God and his word. So if the foundation of your life, especially where your healing is concerned, is not based on the solid rock of the word of God, guess what? It's like a seed planted on the roadside. The enemy is coming. Chop, 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 chop. Pick them up. Phew. I'm not saying don't respect your pastor. I'm not saying don't honor your, your bishop, your G or your reverend. But ultimately, there's only one Lamb of God. There's only one name. That is given in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. By which man shall be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. And unless that is your name. Stop arrogating to yourself what it belongs to God. Because you are not just, you are not just damaging yourself. You are killing your members. That is why a lot of people now when they pray. Oh, the God of my father, the God of my bishop, the God of my Jew. Seriously? I'm not saying don't pray to God, but there's only one signature that signs all the letters in heaven. There's only one name that opens the door that no man can close. There's only one name that is given at the mention of which every knee must bow. That name is Jesus Christ. So if your faith is built on the, the, the popularity of your pastor, the size of your church, the glamour of your building, just so that we are the church in vogue, if that is all your faith is built upon, I'm clapping for you. Because this is what will happen. Oh, help me, Lord. This is what will happen. You remember in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus was talking about the house that was built on rock, and the rain came and it stood, and the one that was built on sand, and the rain came and the thing fell flat. If your faith is not built on the word of God, you are like the house that is built on sand. I don't care what the name of your pastor or reverend or geo or church or business is. It's on sand. Sinking sand for that matter. It's going down. You cannot know God by your feeling. You cannot know God by your thoughts. You cannot know God by the association of your church or the, the, the size of your congregation or the angle or the department that you serve in, this, in the church. That does not make you know God. The only way to know God is by his word. If your faith is not founded on his word, even that which you have shall be taken away from you. Because the, the gospel, the gospel of John tells us in chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 3, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That settles it. Unless the, that Thing, that person, that whatever you believe in, unless his name or her name, its name is God or the word, you are in trouble. Because it said, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made. Unless your geo was at the beginning with God and he made all things by him, for him, through him. Then you, if not, you better one chance. For instance, 
Let, let, me, let me try and explain it this way. If somebody says to you, 2 plus 2, you don't need to go and open your Bible. You don't need to go and get your calculator. You don't need to even have gone to school to know that 2 plus 2 is 4. It is, it is so settled. This, that level of conviction, that level of certainty, that level of assurance, assurance that you have that 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's the same level that I'm talking about your faith being founded on the word of God. If your if the, the weight, if the depth, if the strength of your faith in the word is not equal to the same level of conviction that he is your healer, he alone is your healer, that he himself bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases on, his, on the cross, that in his name is the power. In his blood, there is the power. In his word, there is the power to heal you. If you still struggle with the, the truth that it is his nature, the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the nature of the word of God, to go about healing, delivering, setting free all those who were oppressed by the devil, including you, if you still have doubts about that, you need to go back to faith school and learn. On what ground is your faith? Because the, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 32, tells us, And now, brethren, this is what, if you're looking for me in the Bible, this is one of them. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that were sanctified. It is the word of God. It is the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you your inheritance. And included in that is your healing. Where is your faith today? On what is your faith built? What is, the, what is the source of nourishment for your faith today, my brother, my sister? We have played church long enough. It's time for us to go back to basics and deal directly with God. I saw all oh, one of the greatest joy of my heart. Can I tell you? About this pandemic, I know that sounds crazy that in the midst of all of this, I'm happy. I am happy. Do you know why? Churches are closed. All the doors are sh shut. That assumption that unless you go there, you can't see God, is over. One thing I know, when this is all over, churches will never be the same again. We, people will not be able to play religion again unless they kiss their head bye-bye. Oh, if you don't come to church, God will kill you. God will not bless you. You will not go to heaven. You will die early. Your children will smoke. Whatever. Where is the church today? Church is not the building. We are the church. This body, excuse me, this body is the, is the, is the church. It is the indwelling, it is the, the, the house in which the Spirit of God lives. This body is the church. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't go to church. I'm just saying church can never, ever, should never, and will never be the same again. Never. No. Anyway. Let me stay focused. <laughs> God had God must be laughing. I mean, he must be rolling on the floor. Man. Jesus, look at that. <laughs> he must be, he must just be fun in heaven. I, I just want to have a sneak peek into what's happening in that chamber. Just to see God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit doing like uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. We told you guys this. <laughs> Oh, Father, help us. Even the Bible tells us 
that you should not let your faith be anchored on the sweet talk of men, not even on the perceived wisdom of men. Because what is at stake is more than what you and I can know, handle, or, or, or resolve. It takes the divine power of God. It takes the presence of the Holy Spirit. It takes the authority that's in the name, in the blood, and in the word of God. I commend you to God. This was Apostle Paul. On his, virtually on his deathbed. After everything he has done, after all the letter he has written, after everything, he looked around and said, what, can, what, will, what do I want to be my lasting impression on your spirit? And all he could think of is the word of God. I leave you in the hands of God and the word of his grace. Because that is the only thing that I know in my Noah that can assure you, that can sustain you, that can guarantee you, that can ensure that you receive your inheritance. As they say, you, and you know what our inheritance is? As Christians, it's not a seat in the palace. It's not even a, a mansion in heaven. Our inheritance is God Almighty himself. Oh, Lord have mercy. Your inheritance is not the one-way ticket to heaven. Your inheritance is not the fact that you are going to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Your inheritance is not that you are exempted from the calamity that is coming after the rapture. No, your inheritance, our inheritance is God Almighty himself. That's a blessing for another day. Another reason why people cannot keep their healing is because they have not learned to walk by the dictates of this one scripture in James chapter 4. Verse 7. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 7 said, Submit yourself therefore to God. Full stop. Submit yourself therefore to God. Full stop. Resist the devil, comma, and he will flee from you. Full stop. Your part, our part, what is required of us is to submit ourselves to God. Once we are submitted to God, devil is resisted and he will, he will run like fire on the mountain. But you see, all that we are doing as children of God, all that we're trying to do as Christians, all that has occupied our minds and our lives and our day-to-day -day journey on this, on this road is resist the devil. Resist the devil. I don't want to sin. I can't live in sin. Sin, no. Sin, 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 sin. We, all we're doing is trying to resist the devil in the arms of flesh. It will not work. You think if, uh, if, if coronavirus is a tangible physical thing that we can see, you think the world government will not have taken all the nuclear bomb and arsenal as they have and kill the rascal but you can't see it you can't you can't you can't fight what you can't see with your naked eyes with your five senses 
So every time you try to resist the devil by not doing this, I can't do that, I can't eat that, I can't go there, I can't smoke this, I can't work this, I can't, I can't, I can't. All you are doing, you are just laboring. You will be tired. You will be worn out. You will be totally wiped. And the devil will just say, seriously? I'm not even starting with you. The Bible said, if you run with footmen and they weary you out, what would you do when you have to run with horses? The devil has not even touched you and you are already tired. <laughs> you are already tired because you are trying to resist. You are trying to fight the devil in the arms of flesh because your church tells you, the pastor told you that sin will kill you, sin will eat you. Oh man. Let me do let me say this. I wasn't gonna say it before, but I'm gonna say it. I have just published a book currently available on Amazon in e e ebook or uh, downloadable book. The title of that book is Understanding the True Nature of God. And one of the things I really spent a lot of time on is the, this issue of sin and man. If for nothing else, get that book and read it and understand the issue of man and sin. It will help you, not because I'm trying to sell books. You don't, I don't, you don't bother me when I sold it. That's not the point. Because the church of God has become consumed by the fear of sin that we have forgotten our righteousness in God. Anyway, get it if you can. Understanding the true nature of God is on Amazon ebook. Go and get your copy. The devil is your enemy. His mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he will not let go. He will not give up. He will not surrender. He is not willing to let you off until any, at least one of those objectives are fulfilled. And he's a very stubborn, rascal guy. He doesn't take a no for an answer. Just say, oh, no, let them leave me alone. And then he'll leave you. No. Even Jesus, he came to him three times. If you have to deal with Jesus three times, what, what you think? He said, please leave me, the devil. And then he will just go. No. He will try every trick in the book. He will try every cunning he can think of. He will cajole you. He will, he will oppress you. He will harass you. He will bully you. He will do everything. It will challenge what you say you know, what you say you stand for, what you say you believe. All of that will be shaken by the devil. But you know what? There's one thing that the devil only responds to. The word of God. Even Jesus couldn't do anything. Just said, it is written. Oh dear. And the devil took rest. It is written. Oh dear. If you are going to keep your healing, remember the enemy wants to oppress you by putting sickness and disease on you. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, empowered by God and by the Holy Spirit, went about doing good healing and delivering all those who were oppressed by the enemy. For God was with him. The enemy will oppress you, will suppress you, will bully you, will harass you, will put sickness on you. But when you say it is written, but what is written? What is it that is written that you are going to quote that to the devil? You can only know what is written. Not because you have read this from Revelation to Genesis and to Hebrews and, and Hebrews and all the other bruising in between. No. 
the only thing you will know that is written is when you have submitted yourself to God. When not just Him becoming your Lord and Savior. No, when you live under the dictates of His instruction, when He has become you, when you abide in Him and He abides in you. Now, when you say it is written, the devil said, sorry, you don't tell me what is written. I know already. You cannot resist the devil with empty confession like most of us are doing in church. Devil, I rebuke you. I plead the blood of Jesus. Yeah. He to plead the blood of Jesus against you. Because many of the things we, call, we blame on the devil has nothing to do with it. But you must know who you are and whose you are before you can confidently resist the devil. You have to surrender yourself, your will, your thoughts, your everything to God. Because when you have fulfilled the word by abiding in him, now the devil is in trouble. Because if you, have not, if you are not abiding, if, if you have not submitted yourself to God, shukelegede. Guess what will happen? You remember those seven sons of the prophet, of the, of the priest, or whatever they are, in the Bible that they went to the devil and said, in the name of Jesus that Paul preached, I, I tell you. And they said, seriously? Who are you? Who, who do you wh what? Fear I don't catch you. And he beat the daylight of them and sent them out naked because they have not fulfilled the first part before going to try the latter part. The former part is submit yourself to God. Now you may say, Tunde, so what has that got to do with my healing? What it's got to do with your healing is for you to know that this healing wasn't, it, it wasn't something that somebody just slapped on you. No, it was fully paid for. Oh man. You know something that you pay for, there's a way you treat it compared to something that you just pick along the road and just. It was paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. In order for you to resist the devil when he comes with the symptoms or the report or somebody or one of your friends or your relatives or your spouse will come and say, so how is that your liver again? It's not that person asking. It's the devil knocking on your door. Just trying to see if you will open up. If you say, oh, you know, hmm, that thing nearly killed me. They have to do this. And then they said that. And then they did that. And I have to do this. Why you are doing that? The door is getting wider. It's getting wider. And guess what? The devil will poke his nose in it. Before you know it. That liver that has not done any, that you don't even think about in the last five years, suddenly there's some itchiness around your liver again. Why? Because you opened the door. You did not, you did not submit. You did not resist the devil. So when that person goes and says, so how is that your liver? I say, which one? It's not my liver, it's Jesus' liver. I know some of you think, oh, that's religious. That's your problem. That is your problem. Things that you are supposed to take literally, you think is religious. Things that you are supposed to run away from, you embrace it in the name of Christianity. If you pay, if you go to the market and you pay for this Bible, whose Bible is it? it does it still belong to the seller or to you that has bought it? What's your problem? Jesus paid for your healing, for your health, for your superior, for your soul, so for your nothing missing, nothing broken. And now you want to say it's your liver. From where did you buy it? Surrender yourself to God. Full stop. Resist the devil and then he will flee. And he, he is a coward. How do you surrender yourself to God? Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to 2. Popular passage. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's all God wants from you. Submit yourself. Yield yourself. Commit yourself. Devote yourself. Not to a church, not to a denomination, not to a movement, not to a pastor, not to a anything. No. Submit yourself to God. And be not conformed to this world. Don't use the world's measurement to judge your life, to determine your peace, to, 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 to ascertain where your, where your sound mind is. No. Because the world is crazy. So what do you do? Transform. Be transformed. Be renewed. Be, let your mind gravitate towards the things of God, towards God himself, towards the presence of God, towards the completed work of Jesus. Renew your mind. Let your mind be transformed. Let, let there be a blood transfusion on the inside of your mind regarding Jesus Christ. Because only then that you'll be able to prove what is that that is good? What is that that is acceptable? What is that that is a, the perfect will of God? And we established at the beginning. He said, my, 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 above all things, all I want for you is to be in health and to prosper, even as your soul is prospering. So when your mind is renewed, you will see, you will think, you will speak, you will act like him who is your model. His name is Jesus Christ. And therefore, the enemy may come. The, the sickness may pop up its head. The illness may show up its nose. The devil himself might just come knocking on your porch one day. And when he say, <coughs> he say, oh, no, no, don't say it. I, the voice I heard is that of Jesus Christ. I, I know where to go. I'll try next door. Because you have taken him. You have imbibed. You have surrendered everything to him. And now when the word comes out of you, it is the Holy Spirit himself that is speaking through you. And he said the word in your mouth is so anointed that None of your adversaries, including the devil himself, none of them can withstand it. None of them can gainsay it. When they hear it, he will tuck his tail between his legs and he will run past his bolt on the road. As I finish tonight, as we conclude this series, that healing is your birthright, I want to tell you this. Your healing is yours to keep. Your healing is yours to enjoy. But with that privilege comes the responsibility not only to receive your healing, but to preserve, protect, and maintain it and hold it with all you've got. And don't let the enemy talk, it, talk you out of it so that your life may become a testimony of the goodness and the grace and the power of God and the love of God towards you and towards me. God wants you here. God has already healed you. It is up to you and I to walk in the fullness of that healing. You know, people say you should receive your healing. No, you have already received your healing the day you said, Lord Jesus, I, I ask you to come into my life. You've already received your healing. All you have to do now is to walk in the fullness of that knowledge. All you have to do now is to refuse for that to be taken away from you. You are healed. You are healed. Yes, you. Is it cancer? Is it migraine? Is it your eyes, is it your mouth, your tooth, your nose, your ears, your heart, your chest, your lungs, your kidney, your, 
intestine, your pancreas, your diaphragm, your backbone, your no bone, your every bone, exit your knee, your waist, your ankle, your wrist, your fingers, your hair, whatever it is about you, from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, he's covered all of that in the same package of your healing. May God bless you. Keep you in perfect peace because your mind is stayed on him. And I'll see you again next week when we'll start looking at another series entirely. God bless you. Thank you so much for being part of tonight's program. Like I said, if you can, if you are able, I highly, not because I, it's my book, but I'm saying it because I know what is, what is contained in that book. I highly recommend understanding the true nature of God. It will revolution. It will revolution. It will revolutionize your Christianity, your walk with God, your understanding of who you are in God. You will bump into God in a new way, and your afros will be straightened. I I know. I I can tell you, the people that edited the book and proofread the book. I mean, she said, look, I'm supposed to proofread this book, but this is this book is like taking me back to basic Christianity class. Get a copy. Maybe for a friend. The paperback will come out at some point. But get that book, especially now that you are locked down in the house, You've watched all the movies on Netflix and done all the exercising on YouTube. Sit down, get that book into your system. You, you will be grateful. You will thank me for it. God bless you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Please, if you've not shared this program, I think you should share it. Send it to somebody to listen to. You know that it has been a blessing to you. Help somebody. Be a blessing to somebody else. And they will thank you for it. I'll see you again next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.